starts to come forward this morning, we ask that you stand and pray with me. You will hear a couple times that I will pause for you to just have your own time of reflection, and I will close up that prayer. So I just want you to be comfortable with that pause. Heavenly Father, we are here, and we give you thanks that we are here. And we lift up these things that are in our hearts this morning that we are thankful for. And Father, we give you these things that are burdens inside of us or things that we just want to share with you so that we may experience your Holy Spirit more fully today. Come Holy Spirit and fill us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Join us as we sing these songs of praise of our God's over, overwhelming, never-ending love for us.
You may be seated this morning. As we continue with the Bless series, we'll spend some time listening to Scripture. And so our first reading this morning comes from 2 Corinthians verse 1, or chapter 1, sorry, it's misprinted, and verses 3 through 5. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. For just as the, suf- just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. Our scripture reading this morning from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit who he is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Amen. A couple minutes giving you some announcements. So, um, first of all, because part of the BLESS acronym includes eating together, I just invite you to stay and eat with us, have some fellowship time with people, and enjoy that time together. Um, We welcome Tammy Swanson-Dreheim this morning and her husband Kelly, who are here to share with us. And also... Who are... Oh... Um, As they get up to share, some of the videos are a little bit... I think Hugh told me that sixth grade and up is good, but under that is probably too young. Um, Another announcement, Total is happening tonight in the Pomeroy Park, which I'm super excited about. So if you are a junior or senior hire, you should be there. If you are a kid or an adult who likes to play games, you're welcome to join us. We just go and we play. We don't really climb the monkey bars if you're an adult, so just come. And if you think you can't play kickball, you can. So come and join us. Bring your kids, invite your neighbors. It's fun, it starts at six o'clock. We play for about an hour, and then sometimes I bring snacks to give the kids before they go home. So that is happening today. And are there any announcements that I maybe missed or somebody wanted to share and you didn't catch me this morning? All right, let's continue in our worship. Melanie is gonna share some special music with us. So this morning, we're talking about the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. And um, so that's what I'm saying. (laughs) Surprise. (laughs) And I don't know, like a lot of you know, I've worked at Twin Lakes Bible Camp this summer. And a couple weeks ago, we had our high school camp. And um, we have about 80 campers there. And a lot of them said that they made big strides in their faith walk. And there was one who accepted Christ for the first time. 
And one verse, well, because we're talking about the parables at camp this summer, and the parable of the lost sheep really stuck with her, and how God leaves the 99 sheep to seek out the one. And so, as we're talking about that this morning, I just wanted to, like, give you a little update. Like, praise God. God is good. God is good. All of the time. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. And oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. And I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away. And oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. When I was your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me. And oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. And I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away. And oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99, and I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away, and oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, God.
response to God's amazing love, we get the opportunity to collect our offering this time. If the ushers are coming up. acknowledge that every good and perfect gift comes from you, and we give you thanks. You are the bread of life, Lord. Help us to seek you over the other things in our life that seem important. Heavenly Father, may our worship, our praise, our singing, our gifts be a blessing to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Please greet someone this morning before you sit down. Before Hugh comes up this morning to give our presentation, I just want to invite any kids like Caitlin um, and any high school kids, you may go with Donna. She has some, a presentation to share with you that's a little bit more appropriate, and so you guys can help her if you don't mind, and um, they'll, you can follow them back to that total room, and Hugh, you can come on up and share.
for their faith in, in Christ. We need to pray for them this morning. Also, a couple other prayer requests that I just want to make you aware of, and you can continue to pray for them throughout the week. Um, Frank and Marge, of course, and Larry and Betty Coos. Pam and Charlie have a great niece, Ella, who remains under two pounds and continues to experience problems associated with being a premature baby. Um, we would ask for prayer for her and also for her parents, Ron and Lacey. Um, Janine is praising God that she's here this morning. So there's Janine. Yay, God, for that. You should say, woo <laughs> Good to see Janine. And also a prayer um, to bring his sons to glory and to pray that men will listen to God's invitation. So with that, let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to you freely, and immediately we give thanks that we can come to you freely. We can come to this place this morning and be prepared to worship you and really feel safe in doing that. And so with what we've seen this morning, Lord, we just give you great thanksgiving, and we ask that you not only give us protection um, as we live our lives out in you, but we do ask for your protection and your grace for those imprisoned for their faith. Um, Lord, we ask that your presence is real for them, and we see in their testimony that your faithfulness is true, and we ask that they are brave enough to continue to reach out to you, Lord. Lord, this morning, um, in our own communities, as it's August and we think of school, we pray for the protection of our schools. We pray for our teachers as they prepare to work with our kids. We pray, Lord, that they have love to share with those kids, many of them from divided and difficult homes. We pray that their teaching can be a ministry. Lord, we ask that you can make that happen in our own school systems. And Lord, um, we pray for these people in our own midst. We pray for baby Ella. We pray for her parents. We pray for Frank and Marge. We pray for Larry and Betty and other people that may not be feeling well, even among us. Lord, we ask for you to be with them. Father, we also give you praise for, um, just like for Janine, to get well and to be back here and just to be rejoicing in not only your presence, but the presence of our brothers and sisters that we're with. And we do pray, Lord, that this morning and every day, those who have an invitation from you would respond. Lord, that they would feel the movement of your spirit within them and know that you are calling them to be your follower. Lord Jesus, we lift up all of these things in your name as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy name is the kingdom, Tammy's going to come and share with us this morning. Well, good morning. And I thank you so much for all that we have been experiencing so far. Jen, for your pastoral presence in the service, and to me, before the service started, thank you very much. Uh, I am grateful to Hugh who shared, and Melanie for that song, <laughs> which just happens to be the title of my sermon. I stole it from that song, so um, that means a lot to me. It is great to be here as the superintendent of the Midwest Conference, and I do want to thank you on behalf of all the churches that partner with you to see some great work happening across this region I want to thank you for your generosity and your prayers. And uh, just a couple things to remind you of that are happening right here in Iowa that you can be praying for and kind of ties into the Voice of the Martyrs presentation this morning, Hugh. Uh, we have a church of folks who have gathered from Eastern Congo, refugees that are meeting at the well. We just received this church, Shalom Covenant Church, into membership this annual meeting, and it is such a lively and vibrant church. 
that their, their church has actually grown beyond the size of Urban Heights Covenant Church where they're meeting. So it's quite exciting to be there and worship with them. I understand you got a glimpse of their worship after the annual meeting when uh, you had a little video shown. Um, but also if you would be in prayer for a group of refugees from Sudan who are beginning to gather again at the well in Des Moines. And uh, Isaac Nyamal just uh, were partnering with him in sort of a renewed church plant there to reach refugees from the Sudan. And so what an important work that we get to be a part of in your prayers matter so much to this movement. So thank you for the many ways in which you do pray and care. Uh, let me just begin with a word of prayer before I dig in here. Oh, gracious God, we thank you for your work around the world. We thank you for your work in our lives. And this morning, I just ask that you would take my words, that you would use them to convey your message, your love, your grace, your power, that it might intersect with the minds and hearts of your precious people. And all God's people said, amen. So my text this morning comes from Ephesians, and Ephesians is a book, or rather a letter, that is really comprehensive and that it takes considerable care to paint a picture of who it is that we are as Christ followers and what that means for us. And I'm so excited to spend time in this first chapter where Paul starts kind of right out of the chute here, if you will, with this explosive prayer of thanksgiving. And an interesting piece of trivia for you, verses 3 to 14 that we read earlier this morning in the Greek language is actually one extraordinarily long run-on sentence. Now, that's not obvious to us because in our versions we've inserted paragraph breaks and periods and semicolons and so forth to make it easier to read, but in its original form there are 200 plus consecutive words with no comma, no period, no exclamation point, no question mark, no paragraph break. 200 plus words without punctuation makes for one very long run-on sentence. Now, contrary to what I just said, I actually think there's more to this than it's just a piece of trivia. And here's what I think. As Paul starts this letter and explains what it is that God has done for us in Jesus, covering basically all of salvation history since before the foundation of the earth until all things come together in unity under Christ, as he's declaring this, he's simply so exuberant that he can't come up long enough to put in for air long enough to put in punctuation. And so there's much to be learned from this passage, this rich passage. We'll just barely be able to scrape the surface this morning, but there's also something to be said for the tone in which Paul delivers it. Keep in mind, when Paul wrote this letter, he'd been a Christian for some 30 years. It had been 30 years prior to this that he'd been on that Damascus road and had that powerful, life-transforming experience. And so for 30 years, he had been following Jesus, teaching the Bible. He'd uh, planted churches. He'd been in prison. He'd navigated arguments in the church. He'd started arguments in the church. He settled matters of racial inequality. He employed and gave honor to the place of women in the full gifting in the church. I don't know if he argued about the color to the carpet or what instruments would be used in worship, though I highly doubt it. But I do know that he had been following Jesus and been preaching and teaching a gospel movement for some 30 years when he wrote this. So the gospel was not new news to him. In fact, it was very old news to him, but it was very, very good news to him. And Paul starts his letter with this 200-plus word, broad, brushstroke summary of all that Christ has done for us, all that he has done, and he's so ridiculously, ridiculously ecstatic, he can't pause long enough to catch his breath. So let me just give you a paraphrase of what was read a little earlier this morning to refresh our memory, if I may. We'll call this the Tammy paraphrase. Paul is saying here, listen. I don't have time for commas or periods or semicolons because I am still so overwhelmed with the never-ending reckless love of a God who would send his only son to die for me, to raise him from the dead so that in him I might have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. That God has chosen me before he spun the earth on its axis, before he flung the stars into the universe, I graced his holy imagination and he said, you are mine. 
me. He chose me, he predestined me to be adopted as his child and has included me in his family where I have an inheritance that far exceeds anything I could possibly imagine or experience this side of heaven and I know I've got it coming because it has been signed, sealed, and delivered by the Holy Spirit who is the down payment of all things that are to come for all of God's adopted children to God be the glory. Is that good news, church? Amen. <laughs> so I want to ask us this morning, are we excited about Jesus? Yeah, we can answer that. Are we excited about Jesus, church? Yes. <laughs> Paul was a follower of Jesus for 30 years when he wrote this. He still could not slow down long enough to catch his breath because of the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And I wonder if some of us this morning, perhaps some of us who grew up in the church or some of us who have been in the church for decades, I just wonder if some of us this morning need to be reminded of the enormity Maybe you need to be reminded of the magnitude of what it is that Jesus has done for us. And so what I want to do in these remaining minutes is to dig out some of what has the Apostle Paul so awestruck here. And I got to be clear because what's described here in these beginning verses of Ephesians chapter 1, it is the mother load of spiritual blessings. And we're going to only have time to go digging for a few nuggets this morning. So right away, let me just say this. Nugget number one, he chose you. He chose you. In fact, verse 4 says, He chose you before the creation of the world. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, I remember that we used to have this kind of dysfunctional playground activity in school where we would go out on the break, we'd go out at recess, and they'd have to pick teams. I don't know if they still do this. I kind of hope not. But first thing you do, you divide into teams. You pick two captains, right, side A and side B, and you start picking kids for the teams. And the captains pick the very best until everyone you get down to the bottom of the line and you have the most, shall we say, athletically challenged people waiting to be picked. And it always resulted in these embarrassing moments because often it was the same people who were at the end of the line. And if you were one of those habitually last to be chosen people, man, you dreaded this. Some of you know what I'm talking about, right? Oh, yeah, you're all the athletic types in here. Is that it? Uh-huh, uh-huh. So <laughs> here's what it says in Ephesians chapter 1. You need to know that the captain of creation, before he created the world, he knew your name and he called your name and he said, I pick you. I want you on my team. You are mine. And here's the reality. If you've chosen to follow Jesus, long before you chose to follow Jesus, he chose you. Long before you ever decided to follow Jesus, he picked you. Being chosen before creation has everything to do with the value that he places on us, and by that I mean every single human being. It has nothing to do with a God who arbitrarily chooses some and overlooks others, which is good news. Because I always know when I'm talking to a room full of people that there are some in that room who have felt overlooked at one time or another. Maybe you've never been chosen for that sports team, but maybe you've been overlooked for promotions at work year after year. Or maybe you're not in the in crowd at work or in the neighborhood or at school or dare I even say sometimes even in the church. Maybe you've had a hard time making friends. You don't get the invitations to all the parties. Maybe you've been labeled or excluded, or maybe you've been alone, overlooked, disregarded, felt devalued. I want you to hear the voice of Jesus coming through in Ephesians chapter 1. Listen, my child, I chose you. I picked you. You are valuable, and I want you on my team. Before the foundations of the world, I chose you. Nugget number two, you have been adopted into God's family. Now, verse five here tells us that long ago he decided to adopt us into his family. In fact, it says he predestined us for adoption. So let me share a little personal story with you about a nurse named Shayla. It was a Friday night, 
And Shayla was working in the maternity ward. Now, Shayla had not worked in the maternity ward for a very long time, but last minute someone had called in and said they were sick, and so she agreed to take the shift. And so she was working in the maternity ward when a woman came in who was in labor, ready to give birth, and it was Shayla's job that night to tend to that woman. And while she was caring for her, she learned a couple of things. First, she learned that it would be about two weeks, actually was delivering about two weeks early, which was kind of crazy for this young mother. And the second thing she learned is this young mom was planning to give her baby up for adoption. So later when Shayla went on break, she called home and talked to her husband. You see, she and her husband had talked quite a bit about one day adopting a child. And so she called home and they were dreaming about that. They had two boys already, ages six and seven, that they'd had naturally, but they'd been told they couldn't have more children. And so their hope was that one day they could complete their family through adoption. That evening, that pregnant woman gave birth to a beautiful baby girl, and it created a lot of excitement across the maternity ward, a lot of speculation about what would happen to that little baby. And when Shayla got off duty at the end of her shift, she found herself not able to think about anything else. When she got home and was talking to her husband, they stayed up late into the night. They were so excited, dreaming and talking about kind of impossible things. But nonetheless, they were having a hard time finding sleep. And the next morning, it was a Saturday morning, so usually there's not anyone in a doctor's office, but on a whim, Shayla decided she was going to call that doctor's office and ask about what was going to happen to that baby. Well, there was a receptionist who answered the phone, and she kind of explained what she was interested in. And within an hour, the doctor called her back, the doctor who had attended to the delivery, and he said to her, you know, the doctor who was supposed to deliver the baby in two weeks was out of town and we simply can't get a hold of him. He's on vacation and we have no idea what was supposed to happen to this baby. And so he said to Shayla, since you were the first person to get your foot in the door, if you want to take the baby home, you can start the legal process for that. So on Monday morning, after a frantic weekend of shopping for diapers and pacifiers and bottles and everything because they had absolutely nothing, they drove to the hospital and that baby girl was placed in Shayla's arms and she just cried. She said she just wept with joy. And if you haven't already figured it out, that baby girl was me. I am that child. And I consider my adoption nothing short of a miraculous convergence of God-orchestrated events. And I am so grateful to God for parents who opened their heart and their home and gave me a beautiful family. And I've always understood this to be a gracious and incredible gift, and it's been foundational for my own understanding of my identity as the much-loved daughter of Shayla and Winston Swanson, but even more so as a lavishly and extravagantly loved child of God. Because, my friends, this is our story. Our stories are a miraculous convergence of extraordinary God-orchestrated events that have led to our identity as children of God adopted into his family. Amen? 1 John 3, 1, one of my favorite verses of all time. See what love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. And I remember saying to my brothers growing up, because both of them were born in my parents naturally, while well, mom and dad, you know, they, they had you, they kind of, they're stuck with you, but they chose me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know what life I was saved out of. Maybe it was tragic, but I do know the life that I was given, and I know the life that I was blessed with, and the good news of the gospel is that Jesus saves us from something. He saves us from our sins, from our folly, from a mundane existence, and that's good news. But to me, it's what he invites us into as being a part of his family and giving us an inheritance that we couldn't possibly have apart from him and being treated as his dearly loved children, and that is great news. 
So I just want to take a moment to mine the depths of what it means to be adopted as children of God. And of course, we'll only be able to scratch the surface here, but how about just a couple of thoughts this morning? One of them would be this. If you are a son or a daughter of God, it means that you have unhindered, unrestricted access to God. Now, here's what I mean. When my children were young, and they called out in the middle of the night, guess what, I came running. My children got a little bit older and they were in grade school. If they had a need, you better believe I would be there. When my children were teenagers and they wanted to chat, <laughs> you know I stopped and you know, paid attention and listened. And when my grown children call me today, I'm gonna take that call pretty much no matter what I'm doing and don't even get me going on my grandkids. Why? Because my kids, I give them unrestricted access and because I love them and I delight in hearing from them. And verse 5 tells us you have been adopted. That means you have unrestricted, unhindered access to a God who loves you and who delights in you and loves to hear from you. Now some of you may have had a rocky relationship with your dad and some of you may not have felt a whole lot of love from your dad. Some of you who are here have a dad who really modeled the love of Christ for you in a helpful way. Regardless of your earthly father, what I want you to hear this morning is the voice of a God who delights in you, who says, you can call me dad, who says, basically, you can call me anytime. I will be your father. I have chosen you and adopted you into my family. And there's another thing. If you are an adopted son or daughter of God, not only do you get unrestricted access to a father that delights in you, but you get a family. You get a family. Now, when I was adopted, I got more than just a relationship with my parents. I got a family, and I remember the stories of how excited they were when they knew this was happening so abruptly, but they were so excited. And, and the morning, that Monday morning, when they brought me home from the hospital, my brothers, who were going to the grammar school down the street, came running home, breathless, just panting and standing there and just staring at me. And, and one of my brothers reached out, I guess, and kind of rubbed my arm to, to see if I was real or not. And you see, I didn't just get parents out of the deal. I got a beautiful family, and we belong to each other. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote this about the Christian family. He says, we belong to one another only through and in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, we have been chosen from eternity, accepted in time, and united for eternity. That should impact everything. When I think of God's family, it's so much bigger than just my little family of origin. When you think of God's family, it's even bigger than the Pomeroy Covenant family. It's bigger than the entire Covenant family, as we've been reminded this morning with Hugh, that our family, our people from every nation, tribe, language, and tongue, anyone who calls God Father and knows Jesus, his son. And it means we need to care about the things that happen to the rest of the family. And it means that we need to, when the rest of the family rejoices, we rejoice with them. When they suffer, we care. It means that when children are separated from their parents and terrified, we need to care. When children are shot in the streets or in the school or in the movie theater or in their grandma's backyard, we need to care. When some of our brothers and sisters lack the same opportunities that others of us take for granted, we need to care. When people and places that God loves and God created and he values are lumped together and referred to in the most profane language, we need to care. And when people and Christians around the globe are persecuted, mistreated, maligned, in prison, we need to care because the family of God transcends the color of our skin, the country of our origin, and the language that we speak. God says it, that makes it so, and in Ephesians it tells us that one day, according to God's good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, when the times reach their fulfillment, he's going to bring unity 
to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ to the praise of his glory. And Revelation 7 paints just that picture of the family of God from every nation, tribe, people, and language gathered around the throne of God, praising him in the heavenly realms. And oh, I can only imagine the family reunion that that will be. Amen? Yeah. No wonder Paul was so exuberant as he wrote this. We get a family with all the blessings and all the responsibilities that go with that. You're a family here, my brothers and sisters here at Pomeroy Covenant Church. And you're a part of a greater covenant family. And our family extends to Christ followers all around the globe. And it has been God's plan all along to pull this diverse family together, both in heaven and those on earth, to bring unity under Christ. And we get the privilege of aligning our hearts with God's heart, our plans and our purposes with his plans and purposes, and participating with him to accomplish that in the here and now because we belong to each other and to claim God as father is to claim all of God's children as our sisters and brothers yeah being adopted means you are part of God's diverse family hallelujah okay let me just kind of wrap it up with this third nugget here So we were blessed with every spiritual blessing chosen before the creation of the world, accepted into God's family, adopted into God's family, redeemed through the blood of Jesus, forgiven of our sins, lavished in the richness of God's grace, guaranteed an inheritance, filled with the Spirit of God for the praise of his glory. Now, that phrase, the praise of his glory, if you look in that section we read this morning, you'll see some form of that mentioned three different times in that one scripture. I always think that's time to pause and sit up and pay attention. What is it that Paul's trying to tell us here? And whenever we see references in scripture to God's glory, it's talking about God being revealed. And when we see God revealed, we see his glory, we see his presence, and we see his power, and we can't help but praise him. Glory is all about revelation, God revealing his character as a loving God, a saving God, a God who chooses us, who values us, who delights in us, who adopts us into his family. But in this outburst of praise to God's goodness, Paul turns this a bit and he says, we who are in Christ are for the praise of his glory. And what he's really saying here is that we reveal the glory of Christ. Now in verse 4 it says, He chose us before the creation of the world to live holy and blameless lives before God. Which makes sense because we're for the praise of his glory. And whatever else the church community is, it must be a community of changed people. We have to look different than the world around us. Our primary residence is in the kingdom of God, and and that's where we need to take our identity cues, and not from the toxic, divisive, me-first, dehumanizing and devaluing rhetoric in the world today. We are called to live in alignment with God's plans and with his purposes, which is to bring all things in heaven and on earth under Christ so that we who are in Christ, we might be for the praise of his glory. For the praise of his glory. That's the point. It's a fact. We are chosen by God for the praise of his glory. We are adopted by God for the praise of his glory. We are put in this diverse family for the praise of his glory so that we can participate in God's plan to make Christ known. And the beauty of our life being incorporated into the life of Christ, a people chosen, adopted, loved, forgiven, redeemed, is that God would be praised. To God be the glory. Amen, church? Yeah. So when we ponder that question I asked at the outset, (laughs) are we excited about Jesus? Let me ask it again. Are we excited about Jesus, church? (laughs) We have so much to be excited about. And it is my prayer to you, for you, dear covenant family, that you would know how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. 
to know this love that surpasses knowledge, this overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, and that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God, so much so that it overwhelms, that it fills you, that it pours out of you and into the lives of those around you. And to God be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Oh, gracious God, how could we ever thank you enough for being chosen by you, for being adopted by you as your child, being included in your family? And God, I pray for Pomeroy Covenant Church. I thank you for the amazing ministry that they've been doing here. They understand this well, Lord, this concept of family. And I pray that you will continue to use them, that you will continue to expand their influence, that many in this community and far beyond will become a part of your family as a result of the way in which you have shined through them. And so would you bless them richly, Lord, I pray. Remind them on a daily basis of their true identity in you and the purpose that they have in you. And I pray this in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. amen. Would you please stand and join us in our sending songs, The Wonderful Grace of Jesus, and In My Heart There Rings a Melody.
church, I hope that in your heart there rings a melody. And uh, it's a beautiful song. Uh, It's been a pleasure to be with you this morning, and I'm going to dismiss you with Paul's words coming from Ephesians chapter 3, so receive this as your benediction. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, in him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord and your neighbor.